Well, good evening. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, my name is Olivia Haynes, and I'm the director of the Sanford C. Bernstein & Company Center for Leadership and Ethics here at Columbia Business School. And on behalf of our amazing students, faculty, and staff associated with our center, I am so excited to welcome you all to our Botwinick Prize in Business Ethics, honoring this year's noteworthy recipient, Daniel Lubetsky, founder of Kind Snacks. We are so thrilled to be celebrating Daniel's tremendous achievements and values-based leadership style this evening with this prize, which has long been regarded as one of the highlights of the academic year here at CBS, solidifying the importance of ethical leadership in business leadership, especially in today's globalized economy. Tonight's moderator for our event is our amazing Rebecca Ponce de Leon, Assistant Professor of Management at Columbia Business School and one of our faculty leaders for the Bernstein Center, who will lead us in a fireside chat with Daniel after the award ceremony. But first, I'd like to invite our Vice Dean of Research, Oded Netzer, to the podium to provide us with welcome remarks on behalf of the Dean's Office. Thank you, uh, Olivia, and uh, welcome, uh, Daniel. Uh, um, uh, on behalf of uh, Dean Costis Maglaras and my fellow vice deans, I want to welcome all of you to this uh, beautiful, I guess, uh, spring, finally, spring evening, uh, and to our new building, those of you that haven't been here before. Um, this is truly a special welcome today because um, this notion of ethical leadership is truly at the heart of, of what we believe are the core values here at Columbia Business School. Uh, it is not only our duty um, and responsibility, but, but actually the core of our educational mission uh, to promote ethical leadership um, and create really the next generation of leaders that uh, don't just um, do well, but also uh, do good. Uh, these values are truly at the heart of the priorities of what we value here at Columbia Business School. And maybe just to give you an example, just uh, this fall, we launched uh, the new hub, the Hub for Business and Society, uh, which uh, focuses on societal uh, aspects in the intersection between business and society, uh, bringing together academics, leaders, business leaders, and practitioners to try and address these um, big problems that the world is facing. Uh, and really, th this evening, the Bernstein Center um, in general and the well-deserved uh, recipient today are, are great examples of that, of the role that businesses do play in society and the importance that businesses can play and should play in society. Hey, I want to uh, um, send a warm welcome to the members of the uh, Botwinik uh, Wolfinson family, uh, whose dedication and commitment to the school over the years is embodied in this prize, uh, and the gen and generous scholarship that they've been uh, given and, and re received at this point by generations of uh, CBS students. We are truly uh, thankful for your support. Uh, I also like to acknowledge uh, there are several uh, students in attendance tonight who are the recipients of the annual uh, Benjamin Bottomwick uh, scholarship. Um, I think we have a couple of these, right? Uh, could you stand up? This scholarship is given to the top achieving students who demonstrate passion for ethical leaderships, leadership in our community. Again, something that we truly value here at Columbia Business School. Um, it's such a privilege for me personally to be here and congratulate, uh, congratulate Mr. Uh, Daniel Lubitsky uh, on receiving this prestigious uh, Button Week uh, Prize in Business uh, Ethics. A truly well, well deserved for more than 30, 30 years, by the way, the prize has been celebrated here at CBS. Um, dedication to comment, uh, uh, comm commemorating uh, humanist human humanistic, uh, humanistic sorry, leadership at work. And Mr. Lubitsky here is clearly an exemplary leader in that respect. Um, tonight, Daniel uh, joins an impressive community of past honorees whose purposeful leadership, st style, and uh, social consciousness approach to business continue to inspire students, academics, industry practitioners alike, uh, much like the namesake, by the way, of the prize, Benjamin Bottenwick. Lastly, I want to thank the Bernstein Center for uh, putting this whole uh, event together, um, whose work on value-based leadership and ethics is at the core of what CBS education is about. So 
a big thank you to the uh, Bernstein <laughs> Center here. And, and again, thank you all for attending a uh, today uh, event and I'll pass it back to Olivia. Perfect. Thank you so much, Oded. Since 1989, uh, Professor Netzer actually touched upon this, but Columbia Business School has been awarding the Botwinick Prize to a leader who exemplifies the highest standard of professional conduct and ethical decision making across industries. We'd like to take a moment to actually acknowledge all the former recipients of the prize over the years. Looking at this impressive list, these names are synonymous with true trailblazers in their fields and in society at large always leading with their values and standing up for what they believe in, all while delivering purpose and profits for their organizations. Mm -hmm. And tonight, we are so excited to add Daniel's name to this very exceptional list. The prize was established by Benjamin Botwinick, a 1926 graduate of the business school, along with his wife, Bessie. During his career, Benjamin became a well-respected CPA at the Benjamin Botwinick and Company firm. From there, Benjamin and Bessie's dedication and passion for philanthropic efforts resulted in the founding of the Botwinick Wolfenson Foundation Incorporated, which supported initiatives focused on Israeli and Jewish welfare funds, medical research, and higher education. Although Benjamin and Bessie Botwinick are no longer with us, the Bernstein Center thanks their family members for allowing us to uphold the tremendous legacy of their parents and grandparents with this prestigious award, which means a great deal to us. So this year's nominating committee, including students, faculty, staff, alumni, and the Dean's office, all agreed that Daniel's enduring commitment to humanistic leadership and passion for being a change maker makes him imminently worthy of this prize. His worldview and perspective on business leadership was significantly shaped by his upbringing. Born in Mexico and immigrating to the United States in his formative teenage years, Daniel is also the son of a Holocaust survivor. These experiences informed his business ethos to serve as a powerful force for societal good, societal good. As Daniel's early work included helping to forge meaningful dialogues in the Middle East to help advance peace talks, as well as advocate for a citizen agency to prevent what happened to his father and others from ever happening again. Most serendipitously, Daniel launched KIND in 2004, helping to introduce a new healthy, healthy snacking category to the masses. Since then, Kind has grown into a multi-billion dollar global health and wellness brand with a singular dedication to creating a kinder and healthier world for the past 20 years. Daniel's story is truly inspiring as he teaches, teaches us all that it pays to be ethical, socially conscientious, and unwavering as a leader, which is why it is my distinct honor and privilege to invite Daniel Lubetsky up to the stage to receive the Botwinick Prize in Business Ethics for 2023. Well, if that was just your introduction, I'm very excited for the conversation we're about to have. So congratulations again to you, Daniel, so well-deserved. And I'm really so honored to be part of the ceremony tonight. And so I just wanna start out by taking a step back and Olivia touched on it briefly, but you have such a rich and interesting personal story. So I would love to start by just hearing a little bit about your background and your family upbringing and how they've shaped your leadership style and helped establish this very strong value system that you have. Well, I can start with a lot of really silly examples of how I was raised in a Mexican Jewish community <laughs> where I didn't realize that a lot of the words that I was speaking were Yiddish rather than Spanish. And only when I was 14 or 15 years old, um, because I went to a school that was predominantly Jewish kids. Then when I came to the United States, I went to a public school at, uh, in San Antonio, Texas called Robert Lee High School. And that was very different. Uh, but when I was in Mexico, it was a community of mostly Eastern European immigrant Jews living in a predominantly Catholic country. And for my mom, it was very important that I meet, meet kids that are different from me. And so when I was like 14 or so, I had a Christian friend that I went to a play date with. And I said, right, I'll be right back. I'm going to go pishing. And he says, what? Voy a ir a pishar. It's like, what is pishar? And I'm like, 
I'm going to go pishan. I'm going to go a pishar. He's like, I don't understand these words. Like, stop joking around. Or I'm going to kick you in the tuches. Te voy a dar una pita en el tuches. <laughs> and he says, what is tuches? And I'm like, tuches, you're nalga. And I literally thought till that intervention that tuches and pishar were words in Spanish. I promise you this is true. Every time I tell this story, I get more embarrassed about myself. But that was the uh, upbringing that I had. So how I got here, I have no earthly idea. But um, my parents really, from a very early age, I think the common thread in everything we did was building bridges and teaching us about building bridges. My, um, I, I remember going to the movie theaters. Most of you guys don't know what is a movie theater, but uh, <laughs> it's this thing where you go out and you sit down like that, but you watch a movie. Um, and I remember that day and my uncle Jordan would sit down and would take this big tub of popcorn, pass it around to all the people around them. And some people are like, what? And like, okay, I'll take it. And that was just how we did it. Like we just shared with everybody. And I, uh, now I pass it on by embarrassing my kids. And every time I'm like passing on the tub of popcorn, my popcorn, my kids are like, oh my God, that this tub. But that's kind of, I could keep going, but I think I'll stop there. <laughs> That's perfect. And then leading up to Kind, can you just tell us a little about your career experiences before that and what your passions were and how they helped you develop this really strong vision of harnessing business as this important vehicle for change? When I was in college and I was in law school, I discovered a little bit about the path of economics to address and hopefully resolve the Arab-Israeli conflict. How business could be a force for social impact. And as you all know, what's incredible about business is that it's scalable and sustainable. And as I started reading in college about it, I realized that the theory of economic cooperation is that if you start a venture with a counterpart, as you interact and trade with one another, you shatter stereotypes, and then you end up working with somebody, so you discover each other's humanity, and then you gain a vested interest in preserving those relationships when you're trading with people across the line of conflict. And so you gain a stake in maintaining those relationships. So I tried that right after law school. I tried to turn in, I wrote my college thesis and some law school papers on how to use economics to bring peace to the Middle East. And uh, I decided to try it out on my own when I was trying to consult about it and everybody was like, this confused Mexican Jew wants to tell me an Israeli and a Palestinian to work together. Thank you. You don't know what you're doing. And they actually were correct. I had no idea what I was doing, but I ended up trying it on my own. And uh, I could tell you the long story, but the short story is I created a company called PeaceWorks to build bridges between Israelis, Palestinians, Jordanians, Egyptians, and Turks. And I ran it for several years before I had the idea for Kind. So then this all did lead up to KIND. So can you tell us a little bit about the origin story of KIND? The most important thing to note is that by your standards, peace works was probably an economic disaster. And it's important to point that out because a lot of times we reflect on the incredible success and KIND is a very successful company. But the first 10 years after law school, and you know, my friends went to some of the best law firms, I was taking this jar of sun-dried tomato spread up and down the streets of Broadway, going door by door to let people try the product, and sometimes getting rejected, sometimes thinking that I had a huge success because it had taken me two hours to convince a grocer to carry a $33 box of uh, sun-dried tomato spread. The brand was genius. It was called... Moshe Pupik and Ali Mishmumkin's world famous gourmet foods. Exactly. Exactly. Nobody could pronounce it. It was, uh, but I made so many mistakes. I made so many countless mistakes. And in some ways, it's during those 10 years of mistakes where I drew enough lessons that provided the potential for me to build what became kind. So if you end up going into entrepreneurship and if you end up making mistake after a mistake, that's okay as long as you're drawing lessons for it and being introspective because eventually 
actually from those mistakes, you become so much stronger because you develop a lot more discipline when you are all over the place with your strategy. You become much more disciplined with your strategy the next time. When you're all over the place with your branding, with your marketing, with your supply chain, you learn not to do that again and you're much, much more disciplined. And um, after 10 years of the Peace Rooks mistakes, I did kind of an understand the natural food space, but I was feeling very frustrated with my own options for helpful snacking when I was going door by door, uh, selling my products and I need a snack. Everything was way too indulgent or tasted like cardboard or was indulgent and tasted like cardboard. <laughs> and, uh, and I wanted to find something that would be wholesome, but also convenient and that was tasty, but also healthy. And that was socially impactful and economically sustainable. And that's how we ended up coming up with the idea for kind. A lot of students in the room, if you think you have it hard, think about Daniel marching up and down Broadway with his sun-dried tomato spread. So and, and Columbia, not, not here, but Columbia University's original campus is where I would start. I started like around 122nd, 124th, and there was a small store called La Pico La Cucina. I don't know if any of you know it, if it's still around, but I remember those guys were so nice to me. And they would put uh, cutouts for, because they're all Mexican and I was Mexican, so we're rooting for me. And, and then I would, sometimes I would just go down the west side or the east side if there was a high concentration of stores here and then nothing on the other side. Sometimes I would crisscross. I would literally develop a science for when to crisscross and when to go down. And I would start at 7 a.m. and finish at 7 p.m. taking orders. Then the following day I go uptown and then the next week I would deliver the orders in my beaten up car. And that's how it started. So eventually, you know, you worked it out. You have kind now. So, and of course the company has very strong values. So how do you think about organizational culture as the founder and CEO? And what's your role personally you feel in cultivating an inclusive and values-based culture at kind? Like I talk a ton about that. I care a ton about that. I think that now is the foremost thing I do. But back when I started, I had no idea what I was doing. And so I learned it the hard way. You know, I was not a good manager. I bought one of those like managing for dummies and, and it kind of worked because I was a dummy. But, uh, but I, on every aspect of interviewing or hiring or managing, of, initially it was a one-person operation. There was a two-person operation. Then it was a one-person operation, <laughs> then four, then three, then like it was, it was a very long journey. But along the way, over many, many years, I learned about leadership and I learned about the power to step back. It's, it's, it's really cool. Um, I didn't understand that well uh, growing up. I didn't understand that well my first several years. But once I finally started attracting incredible people that were better than me at what their specialty was, I learned how to work with them and how to learn from them and how to empower them. And eventually I realized that the most important thing in what we were doing is building a high performance culture, mm. which includes uh, things like trusting open communications. Nothing more important. If you develop trust, if you develop openness, you develop the habit to communicate openly sounds really easy it's incredibly hard because if people give you feedback but they don't feel the trust or the openness they're not going to give you the feedback that you're going to get you're not going to get the feedback people might leave without ever having the opportunity for you guys to talk things through talk things through and so i think that's one of the many things that we learned to uh always try to handle things with a long-term orientation, relationship-oriented. Eventually, at KIND, we try to codify what we figured out over years how to do. So at KIND, we have something called KIND values and hungry values. And it was very important for us to explain it has to be kind and hungry because a lot of times people confuse kindness with weakness, with softness, and they're like, oh, you're kind. You're... So they confuse being kind with being nice. There's nothing wrong with being nice, but it's very different from being kind. Being nice, you can be nice and be passive, but to be kind, it requires action. 
you do not require a lot of strength to be nice. You, it's, a, it's a nice trait, but kind requires a lot of strength because you need to reach out to be kind. It's a, it's a verb, it's, 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 it's a performative action. So if you are nice, you don't bully. But if you're kind, you stand up the bully. If you're nice, you don't cause troubles, but if you're kind, you need to solve those problems. If you're nice, you're polite and you might not create ways by giving people feedback, but if you're kind, you have to have the strength to provide people honest feedback. And honest feedback is hard to do, you know? And uh, if you see a person at a party and they have like this big green thing of, in their salad, how many of you are like, Eesh! you just walk away. But if you tell that person you have something, you're, it takes a little bit of reaching into their space. Mm -hmm. Similarly, if somebody's hurting a fellow human being, particularly in New York City, where we're taught to just leave people alone, reaching out to that person and helping them out and helping volunteer, it takes a lot of strength to be kind. And so um, for us, the kind and hungry values, kind is about how we do things with a team spirit, team orientation, uh, integrity, ethical behavior, uh, thinking about the long-term, thinking about one another. And hungry is about being entrepreneurial, about having a commitment to excellence, about trying to dream big and try to aim for the scars, about being a hungry hunter and trying to uh, have an ownership mentality where everybody tries to advance the goals of the organization. So within this framework of kindness and hunger. I think you're cheating because you're only looking at me and those lights are not like. <laughs> you know, I'm going to start cheating. looking. Just I, look at I me. love you all, but I'm going to start looking at <laughs> Professor Ponce de Leon. So within this framework, you're talking about of kindness and hunger. Can you give us any examples of specific programs or structures in place that you help that help push your employees to embody that these values that are clearly so important to you and so important to your business? Well, first of all, we don't call them employees. We call them team members because I figured out early on that the word employee carries all this connotation of like a master-servant mm -hmm. relation. Really, that's too harsh, but like us versus them, employer-employee. And for me, at Kind, we're all in this together. Every person, uh, when I was CEO and controlling shareholder, have stock, whether you were an entry-level janitor or the president of the company, everybody had a voice, everybody had the right to express themselves and had stock options. And um, so they were all team members. We I don't use the term employees when talking about my team. Um, and But it goes with a lot. It's not it, that carries obligations and responsibilities mm -hmm. for how we treat one another. Mm -hmm. And um, I try to carry that on also in, in our family office where, you know, in, in, in traditional companies, you fire people. For me, the word to fire people mm -hmm. and to be on the apprentice and say you're fired, sorry for that job. Um, for me, that's, that's not the way we think is the high-performing culture. High-performing culture, if things are not working out first, you communicate and you talk things through. 99% of the time, Professor Ponce Leon, I love saying Professor Ponce de Leon. 99% uh, of the time, you uh, you solve, I remember his name, Javier Ponce de Leon. I was telling Professor Ponce de Leon that I had a friend uh, in Mexico that had Ponce de Leon, but I don't remember his first name. Now I do. Javier Ponce de Leon. Okay, no, no relation, I don't think. Um, because he owes me $5, and so if you can... Oh, don't, don't come collecting to me. I, I don't know the guy. But, it, but in terms of our culture, um, doesn't mean that things work out. When I told my kids about this philosophy, it was like, yeah, that whatever, like you don't sometimes let people go. No, you do sometimes, sometimes things don't work out. Sometimes people leave you, sometimes you leave, but you do it with, with a very, very exception when somebody's stealing or engaging in sexual harassment or doing something authentically, intentionally racist or horrible when you do take harsh action. 99.9% .9 of the situations, you hire the people. If you took a long time to bring them on. They're not bad people. So if things don't work out, the better way, and it's not just to be kind to them, it's to mm -hmm. create a better culture for yourselves and a more high-performing culture. 
you talk things through and you've developed the trust that you have the right intention, you solve almost every issue. If you don't solve those issues and there is no right fit, you look for a different position mm -hmm. that will be the right fit. And if that doesn't work out, then you initiate a transition. But in the ideal situation, a high-performing culture, the person that's leaving helps replace themselves. They help find the replacement. They, depending on the situation, they might or may not have the lead role in doing that. But very often they do. And you end up understanding and hiring the best replacement for them. And then they train them. Now, that's not possible always. Mm -hmm. Both people have to have a lot of goodwill, mm -hmm. but it's a far better way to create a culture mm -hmm. with both people owe each other those transitions. Better also for the team member because if they choose to leave, they can leave with a great reference. They can go to a business school and get you to write them a reference. They can choose that they want to go somewhere else and you can support them as they search for the job. And for me, the, the, the traditional way that most companies do it is just far inferior to this ideal approach. Mm -hmm. It doesn't that's, always work, but that's better. Yeah, that's the true embodiment of a team. So you also mentioned, you know, there were some missteps maybe early on when you started Kind. So do you have any examples of some programs or some structures that you tried out that maybe didn't work out so well? And then how did you learn from those failures that you faced? I mean, countless things. Uh, there, I, I wrote a book called Do the Kind Thing, where the way I structured the book is I talk about my mistakes, my lessons, and then what we drew from them. And it's organized in 10 chapters. And I encourage you guys, if you're interested, to read it. But something that's not in the book that just came to me is initially I was a micromanager and I didn't know how to manage. And if somebody was not doing what I wanted done the way I wanted done, I wouldn't start doing the job. Mm. Obviously, that's terrible. And it took me years to learn that you need to empower your team. You should teach them some things, but for the most part, you need to empower them for them to figure it out and to make mistakes. And if things are not working out, you need to do some of the other approaches because if you start micromanaging, it's not good for their development, for your development. So but that's one of hundreds of examples of mistakes that we made in new product development where we were too eager to grow and would develop products with a lot of shortcuts and not maintaining the quality standards. That's why with Kind, we're obsessive about not launching something that doesn't meet our brand guardrails because I learned the hard way when at PeaceWorks, I uh, did not hold to the highest standards. And eventually people felt disappointed that our brand that they had trusted would introduce a product that was not as good. So I could keep going. So to, to continue this thread, maybe a bit about challenges and how you've responded to challenges. So no matter how strong your values are, we're all going to be challenged at, at some time or another. So could you describe a time at Kind where this may have happened, where you had an issue that challenged your values? And how did you work through that? And then what lessons did you learn in the end? Well, I, I want to start with a very general point, which is something I've been thinking about for many years that the more I think about this, the more I realize how true is to all of human nature. Every single one of us rationalizes things. And I'm really making an effort to see you guys because these lights are driving me nuts. Um, every single one, sorry, Tracy, I have to give you shit. But, uh, every single one of us um, rationalizes their decisions to make them consistent with their economic interests. Hmm. It is close to unavoidable. The amount of people that have the integrity to go against their personal pecuniary interest because something is the wrong thing to do, it's very, very hard to do. So the best thing you can do in your careers is do the right thing in the first place. Mm -hmm. Because the minute you go in the wrong direction ethically, or you go into a company that does not have the values that you have, it's just going to get harder and harder and harder because nobody's infallible. Like, I'm very lucky that, and I say that lucky, I really do think that I ended up having the idea to make a healthy snack. Because had I ended up at a company that made products that were not so good for you, I would have immediately rationalized why that's fine. And by the way, it is fine because why not? You know, I'm not an absolute. There's an occasion for indulgence. There's an occasion for, I don't... I'm not a purist. I think that's fine. But 
it for me it became much easier to go on the bandwagon of health and wellness and and that because of the way we the journey we took i um i had a friend or an acquaintance that ended up joining a, a company that sold e-cigars electronic cigarettes mm. and I had a conversation with him and I asked him, you know, why did you join this company? This is not good for the kids. It's not. And he, he went on to explain why this was far better than cigarettes. And he was a hundred percent convinced about it. And I do not doubt for a second that he was convinced about it. And he had a couple points, but for the most part, it's an industry that I don't think it's so good for society, but I, I do not have the confidence that had I been in that situation and I would have been so excellent at avoiding, like if, if I had been given three offers and this one I was getting a lot more money mm -hmm. and these other two, would I have the strength? And depending on how my career had gone, I would like to hope that it was, but I just think that you look at how Google reaches decisions and how Twitter reaches decisions and how uh, Alphabet and how well, Alphabet is the owner of Google and even how Kind reaches decisions. Like when we found out that um, almonds consume a lot of water, we immediately went on to prove that yes, they consume a lot of water, but they consume less water than meat and almonds are protein. And we're a hundred percent convinced that almonds are a good protein because they have enormous heart benefits. They, on average, people that eat tree nuts every day live three years longer than people that don't. Almonds are known to have the good type of healthy fats that are beneficial to your heart and to your brain functioning. I can tell you thousands of reasons why they're better. And I can also defend why almonds are not so bad for the environment because if you need to eat protein, you might as well eat plant proteins from almonds that are heart healthy and brain healthy. But you see how I'm explaining it away. I'm not, and we do, and we did also adopt things to try to uh, do more sustainable farming and be friendly farming and all of that stuff. But if I were to find out tomorrow that almonds are bad for your health, would I immediately accept that? No, I probably would want to find the research that demonstrates that almonds are not bad for your health. And that's just my point of being vulnerable and accepting that every one of us uh, suffers from this desire to rationalize. You see in political conversations how people in one party or the other party behave, and you're like, how can they stand by this person that committed all these crimes? And it's because we've gotten into that direction, and it's just very hard for us to get out of it. And so I think all of us suffer from this. It's not, it doesn't just ail people that supported Trump. It also ails people on the left. Every human being has this need to rationalize things, to make them consistent with their values, with their prior decisions. And so we need to be aware of that. That was a very long answer. It was great. But I rationalized the way that it was worthwhile. It was great. So, you know, we do all rationalize our decisions. So even as CEO, you need guidance sometimes. And when I'm in the classroom, a question our students always ask is, so who does a CEO go to for guidance? So how do you get unbiased views, support, or even people that might challenge your ideas and assumptions when you're at the very top of an organization? So my story is very unique because um, while I started PeaceWorks, the company first, I then created a civic movement to build a movement for moderate voices in the Middle East called One Voice, which led to the largest grassroots movement in Palestine and Israel to try to help amplify the voice of moderates. And through one voice, I ended up getting an extraordinary group of mentors that mm. became my mentors for the civic work I did. But I then, when I, when Kind started succeeding, I started getting mentorship from some of those people. So Fred Schaufeld was uh, a, a great force and mentor of mine at uh, one voice, and I asked him to join my board at Kind. And people like Lester Crown, I don't know if you've heard of him, I recently visited with him in Chicago, and uh, Charles Bronfman and uh, Danny Abraham. And it happens to be the case that most of my friends and mentors are like 
in their early 90s or you know Lester's 97 years old but he's as vibrant and lucid as they come and Mr. Wolfenson who passed away like I I'm very blessed that because of the civic work I did I ended up developing role models that were captains of industry with a lot of uh kindness and humility and that were my mentors but even before in the Peace Rocks years, I, uh, I formed an advisory board that included uh, really impressive people that I think agreed to mentor me because of the work I was trying to do to promote mm -hmm. peace through business. So we, we only have a few minutes now until our Q&A. So I just want to ask a couple more things. First, what advice would you give to someone who is just now um, entering a leadership role or to an aspiring entrepreneur? Well, the first piece of advice would be what I said earlier, be very, very cautious about your first step into the business world because that's gonna to lead to another decision, another decision, and where you go in that journey really, really, really would matter. How you will define the rest of your journey, those initial decisions looking back really have a disproportionate impact into where you end up going and how you rationalize your decisions. But I think the other feedback I would give you is just make sure you take the time to reflect and to talk to yourself because I suffer from this. Like I am, whenever I'm in an elevator, I no longer talk to myself. I've checked my phone mm. and I check my WhatsApp and schmatsap and patsap and patsap, you know, all these things, right? Like I have, Email, nothing interesting, text, nothing interesting, WhatsApp, nothing is a signal, this will, this will, that, mm -hmm. vote. Oh, and no, oh, I don't have enough right now. Okay, let me go check the news, the news, 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 Twitter. It is the amount of information available at our disposal that can stimulate us in enormous ways is so overwhelming that we're spending too much time absorbing new data and not enough time processing that data, let alone processing who we are and who we want to become and talking to ourselves and figuring out what matters to me, what gives me meaning. And think about not doing that and living your lives just jumping, jumping, jumping through whatever uh, conveyor belt you start on. Mm -hmm. And then 30, 40, 50 years later, looking back and like, oh my God, I ended up here. So it's so important that you just take the time. It's hard to do. It's really hard to do because you need to put that phone away. And it's hard because you haven't trained your brain to do that enough. You need to put that phone away and either go swimming or take a long shower or uh, particularly you. No, I'm just joking. Uh, that was a bad joke. Um, or um, that was, was that too mean, Tracy? Uh, or, or just go on a walk without devices. And initially, it'll be very uncomfortable. Initially, you'll find it, if you haven't done it, you'll find it hard because it's so much easier to just read another tweet. But just ask yourself, let your brain take you wherever it wants to take you. When the rare times I still do that, it's really magical. And that's how I came up with the idea for kind and for one voice and for empatico and for starts with us. Like you, you, that's how I come up with my best ideas, but you need to just take the time to not be working on anything, to just go for a walk with yourself and force yourself to just let your brain deconstruct mm -hmm. ideas. Yeah. So before we turn it over to the audience, really briefly, I know that you're a big magic buff and I know a magician never reveals the secrets, but is there a magic trick you could do right now for us all? Um, does anybody need her for classes to work on? Can I turn her into a rabbit or? No, I mean, I can show you, like when I was a kid, I had surgery where if I take, for example, this thing and I press really hard, transfer it and it, and it comes back here. <laughs> or if I press it really hard again and press again, then I can make it disappear completely. <laughs> Thank you. 
Well, thank you for indulging me. And thank you for this wonderful conversation. I think we're all feeling really inspired and I'm excited now to turn it over to the audience for any questions that you may have for Daniel. And Tracy will be coming around with a microphone. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Professor Ponce de Leon. We're very proud of you for starters. Uh, and thank you so much for coming. Um, I think- Oh, but you're not proud of me. No, I'm also- I, 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 I got it. I got it. Also very proud of you, but um, so I, I actually read your book before this. I didn't know who you were. And then they said that, okay, you're coming. So I read your book and you faced a very common decision, which a lot of us today at business school face that do we take like the fancy McKinsey offer or do we walk up and down Broadway to, you know, start our own entrepreneurial gig? So for a lot of us who are immigrants, similar to your journey, what advice would you give us taking two very different stark decisions given so much is on the line? Yeah. So there's no perfect answer because there's only an answer for you, right? Every person is different. Um, for me, Taking the road less traveled was clearly the answer, but it was clearly the answer because I loved what I was doing. If you had asked me, and I asked myself, and my kids ask me questions like this sometimes, if I could do it all over again and, and not have kind, not have the success from kind, and I would just be with PeaceWorks, which never broke two or three million dollars in revenues. And my salary was $24,000. Well, actually, no, then I wouldn't do that. $24,000 still today, probably. I probably would have changed that one. But, uh, but, but I loved my PeaceWorks years. I loved PeaceWorks. And I obviously think about it very romantically now. But in 1994, when my glass jars of sun-dried tomato spreads made to cooperation between Israelis, Palestinians, Jordanians, Egyptians, and Turks arrived into my studio apartment in Manhattan, and they were not properly packed. And so the olive oil was oozing out of the box. And when I opened it, I don't know why, I just got emotional. Oh. Told the story many times and never got to me. And like, like when I opened that box and it was all shreds of glass broken, and I had taken all my savings from law school. And, um, and that's what that had become. Like my few thousand dollars of inventory was all broken and the oil was sipping through the studio apartment. I cried. I cried that day and I, and I sat down and I cried right now. So sorry. <laughs> Normally it's about more important stuff. Normally, I, I, my dad taught me to be okay with my emotions, but normally it's about more important stuff than that. But, uh, but, but I, at that point, I, uh, I, I really was taken aback. But because I had a very important social mission, I kept going. And so I think what I told you earlier about finding what you care about that gives you purpose and, and, and that you care about is so important because what you will face your version, those shreds of glass with the olive oil. By the way, very pungent. <laughs> that's why I was crying. It was like, man, that's... <laughs> um, but, um, but you will face those moments. And if you don't have something that fuels you to keep going, then go to McKinsey. Like, you have to really believe in why you're doing... Nothing against McKinsey. Um, no, I liked McKinsey, wonderful people, some, some very good friends that I made out of there, including Javier Ponce de Leon. Um, such good friend that I haven't seen him in 20 years, but, uh, but he was very nice. Um, but um, but you, you should really be prepared for the life of an entrepreneur and really, really um, make sure that it's gonna imbue you with so much meaning that you care about and that you have the personality to withstand the roller coaster because it's not for everybody. But if it is for you, there's nothing better because it's your journey and every day you're doing it, you're building. I, I would work, this was before I had kids, I would work 14, 16 hours 
and didn't even feel it because I was building something that I was birthing that I gives gave me so much meaning. Mr. Lebetsky, thank you first and foremost for your time. I uh, really appreciate all the advice tonight. Um, I guess the question I have for you in the interest of moving you from Mr. Doom and Gloom, um, so, the question I have for you for, in interest of moving you from Mr. Doom and Gloom is what gives you hope for humanity today? Um, everyone here, every human being. I mean, even I, I say 87% think the country's in the wrong direction and want to change it. But even that 13%, of course, there are evil people, but there are not even 1%, not even a fraction of 1%. Every human being I meet gives me hope. The people, no matter our differences, you know, we have such incredible stuff going for us. We care about one another. We are fundamentally kind. We are fundamentally caring. We are fundamentally human beings. We were endowed with this beautiful gift of understanding that we're part of humankind. And we just need to lean in to that aspect of us so that we can transcend all of these very serious differences that are causing. If you ask Americans, and frankly, if you ask citizens worldwide, what values bring those together? Most people are kind. Most people are compassionate. Most people, the overwhelming majority, not 87%, but 90 plus percent, uh, I only added 3%, 95%, 98%. Most people want to help those left behind. They see somebody suffering and they feel that they feel empathy and they, and they want to help the most vulnerable groups. They care about fairness. Now we define fairness very differently. There's a lot of debates about what is fairness and what, what is justice and is it an equal playing field or it is or that those, we can have those debates. But we need to understand that their values do bring us all together in, in the United States. We care about rule of law. We care about nobody being above the law. We care about a level playing field. There's a ton that can bring us together. We just need to remember that, remind ourselves of that, and then work on those daily habits of curiosity, being critical thinkers, not assuming that we have all the answers not assuming that because our bubble on social media told us this and we are reaffirming all of our beliefs rather than questioning ourselves, being questioning ourselves, questioning our leaders. Don't just question the leaders on the other side, questioning our own leaders to understand because nobody's perfect. Compassion to appreciate where the other is coming from and the courage to work across lines of difference. I am completely convinced that starts with us, the movement that I'm a part of that has already 220 plus foremost leaders from Jose Andres to Mark Cuban to Will I Am to people from Erskine Bowles and James Carville to Karl Rove. I mean, a big spectrum of political leadership and musicians and celebrities and people that are coming together, business leaders across all walks of life that are saying, we need to change this. And I hope every one of you will consider joining us. Go to Starts With Us, to our different social media channels, and follow Starts With Us. And put your email so you can get more information, because we, I'm completely convinced that we are going to build a historic movement that's going to really, really change how we all identify ourselves and transcend this hyper-partisan politics into an identity of us as, as being part of the solution. Hi. Um, do you ever consider how the fate of the company may have altered or been altered if you named it something other than kind? Yeah. Because it seems um, that all big companies and especially powerful brands have very simple, clean names. And that saying Moshe Pupik and Ali Mishmunka's work <laughs> wasn't the right one. I think that that was a great anecdote um, in the sense that, you know, kind. No, I do think kind had a. Uh, I think every building block had a lot to do with it. I think looking back, if I have to deconstruct, and fortunately I don't have to, but uh, the nutritional density of our products and the fact that they had transparent wrappers 
and that they had that transparent whip window for you to see whole nuts and fruit. It became uh, a, iconic. The wrapper became more iconic than the name kind. We, we knew from our research that many people would go, oh yeah, I love that product with the transparent wrapper and those phones, and they didn't know the name kind initially. It took us longer to uh, get the kind brand name to become iconic than it took us for the wrapper. But without any doubt, the word kind was a great blessing. And I have to tell you, did you say this is the last one? The last question? Um, I'll leave you with a strong moment. <laughs> um, the word, the brand kind, initially we were brainstorming, my team and I, and just last one, but like two minutes, okay? Uh, how about 25? No. <laughs> so I just want to tell you the circumstances of the founding of kind because it's really important to all of you. 2003 was one of the toughest years of my life. I lost my dad who was my example and my best friend. And around the time, Peace Rooks had some big setbacks and we already were building what became kind, but we had some business setbacks with Peace Rooks that made us question whether we go out and even start the company. And we had these names that were terrible compared to what we became kind of. What's funny is, it wasn't immediately clear at that moment. We had 50 names. Right now, you look at the other 49, and I'm like, why were you even thinking about it? Of course, kind. But in fact, back then, it was not so clear. But we had the name kind, but it was going to be a, a hard road. And then the reason we called it kind was to honor my dad, because my dad was in the Dachau concentration camp, and he survived through the kindness of strangers. And he made sure to tell me about how, and all of his kids, my, my siblings and I, about how horrible and dark those years were, but also how thanks to the kindness of a German soldier and when people were not watching threw a potato by his feet, how that nurtured them and how there were many examples, some of which I share in the book about how the kindness of others helped them survive. And he lived his life with kindness. So kind for us was the adjective that honored my dad, but also will fit into doing the kind thing for your body, your taste buds, and your world. But you go back in 2003, and we go around the table, and we're seven, and we had such a big setback that I'm like, maybe we should throw in the towel and each of us go get jobs. And we literally asked ourselves, should we launch kind? And we you know, had just lost my dad. The company was not doing well. I was barely able to pay my other team member salaries and mine of $24,000. And we went around the table and, and a part of me almost wanted my team to say, fine, let's get out of here because I felt responsibility towards them, but I was exhausted. And I almost went and just got another job at a friend's company rather than did my own. And it was it's fascinating that out of that darkness came so much light. And that out of that meeting, we said, all right, let's try this again. And then it just exploded like a rocket ship. And the first year we did a million dollars and were profitable and cash flow positive. The second year, three, then seven, then 15, then uh, 20, then uh, 30, then 59, then 119, then 242, then uh, 464. Like, we kept doubling and doubling and doubling and every year cash flow positive and profitable. And it was like on a rocket ship. And I had no idea when I was sitting down and I almost threw the towel that that was going to happen. I literally was this much away from just walking away from it. And so it's fascinating how that happened. It's fascinating. I don't know if my dad had something to do with it, mm. but it probably also had to do with just not giving up and then just learning from all of your mistakes and just giving it one more shot and then getting it right this time. Thank you guys. Well, thank you so much on behalf of the Bernstein Center, Professor Ponce de Leon for facilitating an awesome conversation and Daniel for really sharing 
your soul with us. Um, I can probably speak on behalf of everyone here. We host a lot of business leaders, and I don't think I've ever seen a leader embody their values so much as you did tonight. So thank you for sharing that with us. Um, we are the Center for Values-Based Leadership here, and every single student here gets a card with their values on it when they start their journey, and we help them reflect on their, their leadership values throughout their time here. And then as a graduation gift, we allow them to reflect back on those values, and they get that values card to leave and take with them um, as they hopefully change the world. And we would love, love, love to extend this courtesy to you and send you your own values card. Thank you. As a new member of the CBS community. So again, thank you all for being here. Thank you. Thank you. And, and we have one more ask of everybody. We're gonna be, we're gonna let you face this way. Um, and we're gonna ask for a selfie. So if you could all get up, move to the center. We're gonna take one big I'm selfie. Sure We'll we're going to get you out of the lights for once. Yeah, first, you have this headache. Um, and while everyone's moving in, just a quick reminder, please do check in on the with the QR codes. Uh, Daniel has kindly given us 10 autographed copies of his books, which you will receive randomly selected. Right, ready? One, two, Facundo moving. I can't see Facundo. your cute smiling face. One, two, three. Bob Winnick.